This video is brought to you by our friends at Gorilla Car Care, a premium detailing product at an affordable price and your classic car or truck's best friend for maintaining a showroom shine. Go to GorillaCarCare.com today. Do you know why they put the turn signals up high? Safety. Now walk me through the climate controls because these are some of the most interesting I've ever seen. I would love to help you here, but nobody knows. So you start the car using the shifter. Yes. And you can see it's beginning to rise up here ever so subtly. So what about like a downshift? If we were in third and wanted to go in a second. We'll just go around the corner. It's yep. slow, but we'll flick it into second. Wow. And Bob's your uncle. Hey everybody, we've got a fantastic feature for you today because we are taking a look at one of the most influential cars of the 20th century and we're hopefully going to be dispelling some myths around the Citroen DS or do you say Citroën? We'll talk to the owner behind this car and find out the full story because this is a car I think which is very misunderstood in our country and Kevin, Tell me. thanks for bringing the car out. Would you agree that this car has solidified its place in history as being perhaps one of the most advanced of its time period? Absolutely. Yeah. Without parallel, it might be the most advanced and innovative car ever produced in the past hundred years. Well, let's take a look at this DS from um, a perspective of someone that knows nothing about the brand, knows nothing about the car. What is it? This is a 1972 Citroën, that's how I pronounce it, <laughs> Citroën DS21. Okay. DS is the submodel, or excuse me, DS is the model. The 21 is the submodel. Okay, now this is a French car, correct? This is a French car. And talk to me a little bit about the history behind the DS. The DS comes out in 1955. It's the successor to the Traction Avant mm -hmm. that finishes production in 1955. And when this car hits the auto show in 1955, it does some amazing things like break records that weren't broken until the Tesla Model S was available. Wow. In that it had orders the first hour for 750 units. At the end of the first day, 12,000 units were ordered, and by the end of the show, 80,000 units were placed on order. Amazing. So this car w was just astonishing to the people who were just coming out of World War II and looking at things that would have been very much looking like relics. Now in this video we're going to showcase some of the amazing features on this car like the hydropneumatic suspension, like the steerable headlights, um, but I want to put this car into perspective a little bit, right, because 1955 here in the U.S. we're driving enormous land yachts, Buicks, um, Chevrolet Bel Airs, long distances, straight lines. Um, this car, something completely different. Absolutely. This car is a response to high tax horsepower or high taxes on horsepower, yeah. which drove smaller displacement, so you had to make a lot with a little. And they had pocked up, beat up roads in France, and they were narrow. And with that, the French wanted to say, hey, we can compete. We do amazing things too, and this is their answer. This is how they wanted to have a luxury car for their market. Now let's talk about the first thing you notice when you walk up to a DS, and that has to be the incredible styling. Why does it look like this? This is the answer to how cool a car we can make if I'm Antonio, uh, <clears throat> Flaminio Bertoni, okay. or Andre Lefebvre, and okay. I probably got those names wrong. <laughs> but those two were the architects of this style. And they work from the inside and the outside of this car. This is the successor to the Traction Avant, so it was front wheel drive. And so it's technically a mid-engine front wheel drive car. Wild. The engine sits behind the axle. Okay. And so like the Traction Avant, it has the transmission in front of the axle. Well, let's do this. Um, let's go ahead and pop the hood and showcase what we're talking about. Brendan, if you want to get over here on the driver's side, um, Kevin and I will stand here on the passenger side. Now, front wheel drive was pretty advanced, at least for most Americans in, in the mid 50s. Absolutely. Even going in the 1970s, right? Most cars on the road, V8, rear wheel drive. But uh, let's open up this hood and showcase some of the amazing things that, that Citroen pioneered underneath the hood. Wow, you're not kidding about the mid engine. 
And yes, it's a Hemi. This is a <laughs> 2.1 liter displacement aluminum block cast iron sleeve Hemi. And it has a four speed semi-automatic gearbox. Semi-automatic. So we'll showcase that when we get it on the road here in a second. But one thing which seems a little backwards to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, you've got your, your drive belt here in the front of the engine. Um, is the transmission ahead of the whole engine? Absolutely. The transmission is down under the radiator. Yep. Actually, it's forward of the radiator and under this tire. Wow. So the axle is here and the transmission sits here. Unbelievable. So the shafts run through that, you shift, and then it returns back to the front wheel drive. Now, one thing which I just learned from Kevin that I didn't know is this is an inline four, but initially um, Citroen had intended this car to have a much more advanced powertrain. Yes, they uh, were trying to get an air-cooled flat six, and they ran out of time and money, and somebody said, put your wine down. We need to just get this <laughs> thing to the auto show. So, so it had originally the 1.9 liter engine that came from its successor, the Traction Avant. Interesting. Now, um, I always kind of understood that the engine from this was the exact same as the Traction Avant, which came out in the 1930s, but they're a little different. It originally was. Okay. They had to put in what they had, but they realized and immediately was apparent to people, we needed a much better, more modern power plant. And so they worked in parallel, get these things on the road, get them in people's hands, and then they would work on the engine. And they sure did. In rapid succession, they developed the two liter and the 2.1 liter, which this is, and then ultimately it becomes a 2.3 liter. Do you have any idea what the horsepower number is approximately? This is about 109, okay. 110 to up to 115. And this is a carbureted version. Now on the 2.3 with the Bosch fuel injection, they got an uh, injected model of 2.3 to 141 horsepower. Wow, that's pretty good. Now, when I hear that number 109, and I look at the size of the car, um, I would initially think that there is no way this car can do highway speeds comfortably. What has your experience been? It's amazing. Now, I wouldn't want to race anyone with this car. Well, I would, but I wouldn't tell them I was racing. <laughs> uh, but the aerodynamics on this car make it quite easy. To, once you get up to speed, it just holds the road and it can hold that speed wonderfully. It's pretty cool. Yeah, and, and cool. in that way, it, it feels a lot more modern than you might think of for a 50-year-old car. Yeah. Now, just looking up underneath the hood from someone, you know, not in the know, even I'm noticing some really interesting things. So, for example, the disc brakes appear to not be at the wheels, but they're inboard. Is that correct? That's correct. The brakes are inboard power ventilated disc brakes. Wow. And that was one of the first of its kind as well. That's part of the innovation and the advancement of this car. And was that to try and reduce the unsprung weight? That's exactly right. Okay. It reduces the unsprung weight and uh, it makes it modular so that you can work on it. And it was just, uh, they thought that was the better way to go. Very cool. And I would have to agree with them. Now, looking at the radiator, um, can you explain to me what is this cover in front of the radiator? Well, it's part of the air and the ducting system. Okay. Air enters through the slits here, and it's made to pass beneath the spare tire and into the radiator. Oh, interesting. And it's part of the aerodynamics. They realized we could cool it and we could have our good looking and cool. Yeah, one of the most, and I've never really realized this until you just said that, but a DS doesn't have a traditional grill like any other American car from the 50s, 60s, 70s. Right. So the air actually comes in underneath and then do you know why they put the spare tire up front here? Uh, packaging. Okay. Part of their clever, they used the rear for a, the uh, trunk. I mean, of course they did the boot there, yeah. but they made an enormous trunk with that. And they actually thought this could be, it fit here, and it worked into the design, but they actually thought about this being a safety. A safety? Uh, yeah, you could, if you smashed into something, this might absorb some of the impact. Now, let's talk about that a little bit, right? Because um, pioneers in safety that come to mind throughout the 20th century, Volvo, Mercedes. Um, but 
This car has a lot of safety gear built into it as well. Absolutely. This car, uh, they were really hell on wheels for safety. Okay. And for example, that tire we're just talking about, they knew it wasn't going to do a lot for a front end impact, Yeah. but they put it there because it was going to do something. Yeah. They didn't have the, uh, ad, the uh, available computer modeling that we can do today. Right. However, this engine is designed to go under the car in the event of an accident. Wow which is an incredible safety feature. It is an incredible safety feature. These wings, as they call them, and the hood are designed in the way that they could figure out to crumple. Wow. Yeah, and this space frame is designed to deal with a rollover. Okay, interesting. And on the side, the impact, these doors are quite substantial, and this is a side impact beam. Even in the 50s, they were yeah. thinking of side impact. Yeah, they, and, and seat, seat belts, padded dashboard, and the incredibly padded and comfortable seats were all meant to reduce driver fatigue and afford them safety in the event of an accident. What's crazy about that to me is, let's look at this particular car, 72, right? In 1972, you had shoulder belts, you know, a lot of American cars were still running lap belts that nobody wore. A lot of American cars had steel dashboards and non-collapsible steering columns, right. right? And this is a car, even in the 50s, that was thinking about this ahead of time. Exactly. Yeah, really cool. And a built-in safety feature that isn't apparent is that these wheels, if you had a flat on both of these wheels, at, on the same time, at the same side, you could drive this car to safety. Wow. This car would not pull you into the ditch. Interesting. Now, we need to, I think, move on to um, probably this car's most notable feature, which is the suspension. Um, and we're hopefully gonna talk a little bit about what it's been like to service, because um, a lot of people think these cars have air suspension, but they don't, right? No, that's correct. These have what is properly called oleo pneumatic. Okay. Most people call it hydro pneumatic, yeah. but hydra is for water and air. This actually has oil and air. Very so cool. So technically these are oleo pneumatic. It's the suspension is. I've learned something new. That's really interesting. Yeah. Now, um, and it has independent suspension through the spheres, which we'll get to. Yeah on each wheel. Well, let's take a look at those, right? Because um, as someone that doesn't know about these cars, you get underneath the hood, you start poking around these things, and you see these green orbs. And how does that work? Oh, your car doesn't have those? Um, typically, <laughs> it does not have the green <laughs> orb, I have to admit. This is one of the suspension spheres that are at each wheel. Okay. Hydraulics, non-compressible, come up through here and the height of the car is set by a lever in the kick well. Hydraulics come up to here. That sets the height of the wheel, or matches the height you've set it at. Horizontally here in this equatorial position is a rubber membrane. That rubber membrane separates the oil from the high pressure nitrogen gas that's above it. And so the car then is compelled, it rides on air, if you will. Interesting. Now, um, you also get an extreme amount of up and down travel from a static position. Do you know what the up and down? I think it's about 13 inches of range. from the range. Wow. And, um, you know, when I think of suspension that goes up and down, I often think of old Land Rovers, old Range Rovers. You always see them collapsed, right? Because the airbags have failed. Um, and I think a lot of folks think that these cars behave the same way, where they're a constant nuisance to keep the suspension working. What has your experience been? This is tremendously reliable. Okay. And by the way, to service and repair the suspension on this, it doesn't take but a few sips of wine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All you'd have to do is get what amounts to an oil wrench, or an oil filter wrench, excuse me. Yeah. Spin this, oh, you'd set it up to the very highest position. Spin this off, have a sip of wine, and you'd spin the new one on. Wow. And that would take care of everything. So do you have... So if that should fail, that's all it would be required to service it. That's it. Do you have hydraulic lines running throughout the car? I mean, are they going left and right? Yeah. Yes, there are. Okay. This car has... It has... It courses this green fluid, or it's Vulcan blood, through its veins. Hmm. That's the reservoir for it. 
and this is the heart of that system. Over here is, this is a, a pump that produces 2,500 PSI of hydraulic goodness. Wow. And that operates four systems. The suspension, as we've just mentioned, this is power rack and pinion steering. The brakes, which are power, and the four-speed semi-automatic gearbox. And all of those are operated by the hydraulics. So, I mean, naturally, you know, it would seem to me that if you were to spring a leak in any of the systems, you're gonna lose all the systems. Is that correct? Ultimately, you will. Okay. You would notice that, ah, uh, it steers kind of leaden and funny. And wait a minute, um, the suspension is acting funny. Okay. But, so, if you didn't notice then, you should notice on the dashboard a huge red-lighted stop. Okay. And it's an idiot light, and if you don't yield to it, you are the idiot. <laughs> uh, so you get several brake applications so you could get it off the road and stop and safe. So one of, I think, maybe the, the myths I read a lot online is that if you spring a little leak, you go to press the brake, nothing's going to happen. But that's more myth. Okay, more you myth. You know, they actually did build in, knowing how this might become a problem, they built in a lot of, again, safety features. So how long have you owned this car? Uh, five and a half years. And you drive it very regularly, am I this correct? This is my daily driver. So in those five years you've owned this vehicle, um, how much time have you spent on this system, you know, the, the hydraulic system? Has it been constantly failing? No, this has been remarkably reliable. Mm -hmm. I had one kind of failure on a regulator. I serviced that myself. It was just a bad ordered sphere that I replaced. Right. And then a few months later, I got the replacement and I did it myself again. And that's really the only hydraulic problems I've had. So where do you think that this car's, you know, reputation for unreliability and extreme expense comes from? I think it comes from a bias of ignorance where okay. people don't understand the complexities of it and whatever they've heard have been outliers and oh, my friend had one of these up in Oregon and oh yeah, it failed on his dad and they couldn't find anyone to work on it and so it ended up out in the fence row and yeah, that was the end of that car. No one ever wanted it. And so it, it's about education. Interesting. You know, as this car goes, if you understand it and just live the question about what it takes to enjoy this car, you know, it's incredibly reliable and a whole lot of fun. Now, this is, am I correct in saying, a car that was sold new in the U.S., right? Yes, this car would have been sold new in the U.S. It's had some history, and it would not have had these covered headlights as those were a European spec. Additionally, this blinker would have been a European spec. Yep. And, but this is a North American spec, this lower blinker, along with this orange reflector. So, and so you see those kinds of things common to cars from this point on as mm -hmm. our DOT requirements mandated these. So I have a little, I'm a little over kitted here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that is, that alone is something that most people don't realize is these cars were sold new here in the States. Absolutely, they sold about 38,000 of these in the States. Were they expensive relative yes, to other cars? Yes, they sure yeah. were. Interesting. Uh, yes, this is a car that you could have, for the same price, gone out and bought uh, the best Buick that you could have asked for. And it would have had more horsepower, it would have had air conditioning and power everything. Right. And I think that is, you know, something that if you rewind to the 1970s in the US, that's a big ask to ask a consumer to completely abandon their traditional V8 exactly. steel land yacht and go for this French spaceship with suspension that goes up and down. Exactly, you know? and, and so this car uh, was just a, a bridge too far for a whole lot of folks. And it was sold to, you know, architects, doctors, and <laughs> people who wanted an interesting, quirky ride right. who had the money. So let's talk about um, this little uh, serviceability item here, right? So it says, caution, do not use brake fluid, refill only with green LAHM liquid. What does that mean? That means, if you are low on any of the hydraulics and you put anything but this in it, you might as well just start hitchhiking. Okay. <laughs> you will fail this system almost immediately. Interesting. 
because those fluids are not immiscible and they should never be mixed and you will discover the hard way that you've ruined your beautiful French car. So can I ask what is LHM? Liquid hydraulic mechanical. It's mineral oil. Oh, it is. It's a kind of mineral oil that's engineered for this, and I'm not certain, so a little history check. I think they use something similar on aircraft disc brakes for your plane to stop. Very interesting. Now, can you buy this fluid nowadays? Absolutely. You don't get it at your local auto parts store, but I have a contact in California, and it's quite easy to get. Very cool. Well, Brendan, let's start making our way to the rear of the vehicle. Because what I love about the DS is it's not just like the engine that's interesting or the, the semi-automatic or the suspension, it's everything. And coming around to the rear, do you know why they put the turn signals up high? Safety. Okay. Visibility. And this car, just a few weeks before they finally released this car to the public in the early fit, when it debuted, they didn't exactly know what they were going to do. Hmm. And a Fl and a Flaminio Bertoni, the designer, finally said, oh, wait a minute, okay, I got an idea. And he sketched this out and then put these on and they just said, we're gonna go with it. Okay. And here's the hint, this is a North American light. In the European spec, you wouldn't see this light in 3D here, the recessed and flat. Here. Interesting, okay, so they changed a little bit. Exactly. So. Um, I've, I've, I've played around with these cars a little bit, and I think one thing which is really interesting is, you probably get asked a lot, how do you change the rear wheel? Because there's no cutout, there's no like obvious skirt. Ex great question. First you get your wine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, you use a speed wrench. Okay. Ah, wait a minute, let me back up. This car doesn't have a jack. Yeah, okay. I forgot, yes, yeah, so your car would have to, you'd get your jack out and you would start jacking it up. This car uses the hydraulics and the post from this doohickey here in the front of the car, this is hung on a post that's in the middle of the rocker panel. That's a pin, so you'd lift the car all the way up, you'd put this pin in here shove the hydraulics to the lowest position mm. and it will come up on this post and it will raise the wheels on that side. Very cool. That's very cool. Um, and and one with thing that, then you have, there's a speed wrench that's down here for the handle. It's under the tire. Yeah. And with that, you come around here after it's jacked up and this bolt here is the same thing as the lug wrench. Oh, no and way. So you simply twist that off, set it down, have another sip of wine, and you remove this fender yep. and change the tire. So um, one thing, and we kind of hinted at it earlier too, which you can do on this car compared to just about any other, is if you get a flat on a rear tire, you can remove the wheel and drive it on three wheels. Exactly right. This car can be operated. Now, you wouldn't want to go through uh, Le Mans that way, and you don't <laughs> want to be on highly twisty, windy things or operate at a high rate of speed, but absolutely, this car, you'd presumably use, you're the driver and you have a flat, you'd want to have this tire mm. opposite the driver as the one that you didn't have populated. Right, because of and the weight distribution. The yeah. weight distribution. Yeah. And with that, it absolutely can be operated on three wheels. One of the cool things I love about these cars, and it's just like such a small detail, but um, the, the, the dual little exhaust outlets are just so French. Yeah, and you know? well, it's a performance car. Is it? <laughs> no, <laughs> it'll perform, but. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Now let's do this, um, Kevin. I'm gonna have uh, Brendan, uh, we're gonna open up this door here and showcase the dashboard a little bit. And if you wanna actually step behind the wheel, um, I think that's gonna kind of be the best way to do it. And I'll, I'll talk to you from out here because uh, the oddities continue on the inside and starting with the steering wheel, what is going on with that one spoke design? That's one spoke because they figured out that steering wheels block your visibility to your gauges. Hmm. And they figured out they could do a single spoke steering wheel. Yeah. And it's my understanding that it's also a case of you'd want that at about seven o'clock. That's the proper place for it. And if you should be in a front end accident, yep. your body would come onto the wheel 
and it would bend or fold the wheel over and eject you off of it and you wouldn't be impaled by the steering shaft. That's super interesting. Yeah. Wow. And I'm actually so, I'm gonna come on this side. Keep going, yep, I'm listening. So the, the, that was part of the, again, the, the safety. I can grab the camera for me, Brendan, because we're gonna showcase some interesting things there. So the dials on this car are also a little bit unique. And what do they, what do they show? So walk me through what the gauges show. This is the stop sign that I referred to before. Yep. And that, if that comes on while you're driving, you should do what it says. <laughs> Other ones are for the emergency or the e-brake, which yep. you have to use because this doesn't have a conventional transmission. And this one up here is the hydraulic pump. And that light goes out after you start it up and it has sufficient pressure to be operated safely. Gotcha. Now the speedometer is not a normal speedometer either because it says stopping distance. That's right. I don't know who would look down moments before their impact, but it will indicate how far you have to go before you stop at any given speed. As it rotates the dial around, it uncovers a distance. Wow, that's pretty <laughs> cool. And then looking at the steering column, we got to talk about the Citromatic. What am I, what am I referring to there? A Citromatic is a clutchless semi-automatic gearbox. And with that, you simply flick this with your finger and it only requires that kind of pressure, very light, so, to shift the gears. And it's integrated into the carburetor and the hydraulics. And so when you flick this and release the throttle, the carburetor pulls on a switch and it tells, oh, engage the clutch, and you return to power, and it sets your clutch. That's pretty cool. Um, and am I, am I correct in saying there was also a, a column-mounted manual, right? Yes, and that column-mounted manual would have exited the steering column about here. And it could have been a four, or in some cars, uh, a five-speed. Five-speed on the column. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Now, the Citromatic um, doesn't use a torque converter, you were saying. It's all based on a clutch. Exactly. And it's all based on the pressures and the carburetor at any given time, and your return to power. Wow. Has it been pretty reliable? Amazing. You, and that's, again, it's important to get that set up the way it should be. And once you do, it's incredibly easy driving and it's super reliable. Now walk me through the climate controls because these are some of the most interesting I've ever seen. It almost looks like a piece yeah, of art down there. I would love to help you here, but nobody knows these climate <laughs> controls. They're quite inscrutable, but I'm only half kidding. You can see the hot and cold. Yeah. And that operates the uh, heater box that's up here. Just. A, a, yeah, uh, just on the other side. Yeah, and then you end up with where it's going to go in the dash, high or low, and then whether you're, uh, you're going to go, def excuse me, uh, the heater, that's a defrost, and then the lower one would be the def I'm sorry, I got that wrong. The, <laughs> yeah, that's like I it said. Makes a lot of sense, yeah. Exactly, so high or low, so defrost or heater, yep. and then recirc or cabin air, or wow. excuse me, recirc or forced air from the outside. Gotcha. Important to note, in 1955, this car, if you'll notice, it has da these vents in a dashboard, right? Yeah. You've never driven a car maybe that didn't have those, right? Right. Well, this is the first car that comes out with vents integrated into the dash. Wow. And so they don't have something funny and ugly hanging underneath your dash yeah. as every other car in its era did. Now, what about the buttons across the dash? What do those do? Let's see. I've got a, uh, that's a light, the internal interior light. Yep. This would be a hazard light. Okay. And a fan, and you only get one speed. <laughs> um, you get on and off. Yes. And then the, um, you know, I don't use that one. The frost? You no, know, I don't remember what that even is. Let me tell you, I haven't used it, so Fair enough. I, I can't remember. Not um, that important. <laughs> right. And then over here, you also have some more additional yes. controls. So again, you know, you can get natural air coming right through this cab, and it's wonderful. So you're out bimbling about on the countryside, and you get air that flows through, and it, it moves through the cabin in such a wonderful, relaxed way that it, it doesn't chuff, and you can have a nice conversation even at speed, and 
it just makes part of this car a, a joy to drive. We're gonna demonstrate how some of these incredible features work. So how do you start a DS? The key over into the on position, you get the lights and you engine start this <laughs> with the shifter. So you start the car using the shifter. Yes. Now what's smart about this though, is there's no way to start the engine in gear. That's exactly right, good observation. And you might have noticed that light was red and it went out. Oh, cool. And so that tells us we could go do something. However, if it's been sitting for very long, it wants to, and you can see it's beginning to rise up here ever so subtly. When you stop this car, the hydraulics at the height you last left it will start to sink. Oh. And all that fluid will return to that reservoir. And so with that, you start it up. It notices it's not at the correct height and it pumps itself back up to the desired height. Do you know how the car knows how to stay level? So like on a modern car, you have these little height position switches which are all electronic. How does this car know? This car has a, a very clever hydraulic engineering into it. And that's a, a great mystery. They, they, they have pressure and I want to say sensors and that would indicate they were uh, electronic. electronic, Yeah, but they're not. Um, and it, it has to be noted that this, so it brake levels in, in a, I mean, it adjusts the height amazingly well. Yeah. This, this is a box underneath here. Yeah. And if you and Brendan climb in the back and we go haul, you know, Brendan's Jeep parts out of the mountains, every other car you know of will sink down because of leaf springs. Right. This car, once it senses that the back is settling down because it has a load on it, it will return the car to the height you set. Wow. And when you hit the brakes, it won't dive. It's an apportioning valve that slides and it's very clever and it planes out and stops flat. That's really neat. Now let's talk about the brake orb. Um, what, is, what is that? How does that this work? This is a brake button. Okay. <laughs> and this is a switch. A high, it's an opening to a hydraulic switch that's scarcely bigger than your pinky nail. And it lets you deliver with toe pr pressure 2,500 PSI to those inboard power ventilated disc brakes. Wow. So I bet when like a lot of people were test driving these in the 70s, they were going straight through the windshield when they would hit that orb. You're exactly right. These yeah. cars, they're incredibly effective and very sensitive. So learning how this car stops was, for me, it was one of the earliest lessons I had to learn. The now, shifting and the braking were absolutely things you had to learn and you didn't hack this you had to do it the way it was set up and engineered. Interesting. Now I'm gonna go around to the front and I wanna demonstrate the headlights because this is one of the coolest features. Do you know how much they swivel? About 80 or 82 degrees. Wow, look at that. So they come on with the high beams. You can see he's got the wheel full left and then as he transitions full right, that's incredible. Is that a noticeable thing in the night? Do you, do you oh, see that? Yeah. It's tremendous. It's a little freaky to get used to but it's incredibly effective. When they say you can see around corners, they're absolutely right. Very cool. Now let's talk a little bit about the suspension controls um, and how those go up and down. How does that work? The lever you see here is for the height adjustment. Okay. There are three positions that are the normal operating height with the very uppermost one and the very lowest one for the uh, settings you'd use during service. Very and cool. so I can lift this up from its existing height and that heavy line is for the normal day-to-day -day driving. Yep. But so now if I lift this car up, or I, excuse me, when I set that height, the car comes up to its maximum. Wow. And it's fast too, you know? Yep. And you can see even in the rear where that rear tire and hubcap was almost completely uh, blocked. Now you can almost see the whole thing. So that was probably a several inches of an increase. Look at the ground clearance. Wow, that's unbelievable. I so, think I could follow a Jeep into snow on a trail and he will leave a mark 
before I do. Now, I believe that when you raise it up, the suspension gets pretty firm, right? It gets very firm. Yeah. Again, you wouldn't operate it except under extreme conditions that way. Right. The road was really bad or you had a, a safety issue and you had a tire missing and you needed to get to some place where you could then service it. Now, to go down, do you just move that little lever to the middle position again? Exactly right. I simply set it to the desired height and voila. Wow. Unbelievable. Yeah. It's almost immediate in how quick it responds. Yes. All right, go for it, Kevin. So there's two, there's two, two horns in this car, right? Exactly. It's a little out of adjustment. But you can, you get a toot. And, and this one's a little. That's a very, what I love about that too, is like you can hear the two horns and it's done in such a way where it's a very, um, it's very discordant, right? Like there's a lot of kind of crunchiness. Exactly. And I, I they're a scooch out of adjustment. I haven't fussed with them after I got it back. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so otherwise there's a light toot and a get out of my way. <laughs> such a good idea. Exactly. You know, especially with everybody nowadays texting at stoplights, you know, having just like a little toot versus our exactly. and by the way yeah it, it should be noticed that controls are on the column in a very modern way okay like these lights I see you Let's know blinkers blinkers wipers washers you know this is the kind of thing that you take for granted today on any modern car and it was like this in this car in 1972 wow and I think that's an important thing to notice, that this car was highly innovative and we take it for granted, for example, the covered headlights, which every car you buy today has a covered headlight. So this car, being as innovative as it was, and still is in a lot of respects, beauty was more than skin deep. Every one of these green panels could be removed from this car and put in a pickup truck and you could take two of the wheels and I could still chase you down. <laughs> and so none of the green are structural. Okay. They are hung on the frame and it has a space monocoque frame. Oh, interesting. So instead of a ladder frame or a unibody, it's a combination. So you could strip the car completely down. Everything green could be taken off quite easily and you could haul it away and I could still follow you. Additionally, the roof is fiberglass oh. and the bonnet is aluminum. Oh. And it's all to lower the center of gravity. Very interesting. And so it's a part of, and between the streamlined shape and those materials, they, that's part of the innovation. Wow. Oh, and another funny thing. In the same time period, in the early 50s, Rolls-Royce and Jaguar were still using wool carpets, but they didn't think about that. They said, we're gonna use these new carpets that are polyester. Okay. They, again, they use the most innovative and novel and the newest materials and stainless steel. Yeah, lots of stainless. Yeah. yeah, so they were really hell on wheels to innovate and from materials and where they were gonna put it and how they were gonna treat it was absolutely the norm for So Kevin, how does this car do in rain and bad conditions? Does it do pretty well? It's tremendous. Yeah? It, as it's front wheel drive, it really handles like a modern car because of that. Yeah. Now, um, 109 horsepower, you've had this up to 7580. Absolutely. Yeah? It takes a little bit to get to 75 and 80, but once you get there, it handles it with a plumb. Now, talk to me about, well, let you get your seatbelt on here in a sec, but I think one of the most novel things is, you know, every part of the driving experience is different than you might expect, starting with the transmission. So when you go from the start position to first, anything you need to do with the pedals or is it just moving that lever? You just flick the lever and I will demonstrate. And by the way, yeah. it's noteworthy here. This is the emergency brake that's yep. down here. Uh -huh on the left side of things. This car doesn't have a tr typical transmission. There's no way to anchor this car to the ground to keep it from rolling away. So you have to use the e So you have to use that 
and you bookend all of your activities with that and you release it with that lever up here. Very cool. And the light goes out and you're ready to do what you'd like. So what's the pattern? Is it the... Right here is the pattern. So it, just a simple flick forward, that's first. Yep. And second, and you simply keep moving it down the range as you need. Wow. And to, it operates acoustically and in a driving manner, much like every other four-speed car that you know of. Interesting. You know, at first gear, it's a low gear, and if you were going down, pointed down a hill where you didn't need it, you could start in second gear. Very interesting. And, and so the rest of it will feel and drive out exactly like you think of every other four-speed shifter going. So we're going to go into first, so you push it forward. And it, it's worth noticing, as though the RPMs, my foot is on this brake, Yep. and the RPM, you can feel it doing things because it's, it's active. So I flick it into gear, and you can hear it load it. Hmm. And now it, that's the clutch having engaged, and when I take my foot off the brake button, it then will creep and operate in first gear just like every other automatic you know of. Wow. When you're in traffic, you just simply take your foot off the brake and it will crawl. And this car does the same thing. But it's doing so by using the clutch, so there's no torque converter. There's so do you have to replace the clutch on this car at some point? Oh yeah. Yeah? And so you can see where it, it simply, it behaves just like a normal automatic would. Now when I think of a, a car from the 80s or 90s trying to operate a clutch, let alone from the 50s or 60s or 70s, um, is it smart enough to, you know, you know, start you up hills, to allow you to parallel park, that kind of thing? It's incredible. You know, the operation of this clutch and the way it's been integrated means you really don't stall it out. You know, the cars you're talking about, you had to find that engage point when you were on a hill, for example. And in this car here, you put it in first gear and simply depress the accelerator and off you go. We're going to go left here, by the way. Have you ever stalled it? No, it doesn't really stall. It's funny. It just doesn't operate that way. So once you're done with first, you know, you've accelerated away. What's the procedure in a second? That's all there was to it. So you I do... simply flick the gear. I take my foot off the throttle yep. like you would in a normal clutch and flick it to the next gear that I want and return to power and off we go. But you do pass through like a neutral gate essentially. It's you're flicking a detent that's the top end of the hydraulic controls. Okay. And so it it, it isn't neutral in the way your gearbox would be in another car. Interesting. Very interesting. So you can see I just flicked it into third and with that it said, "Oh, well, that's the gear you want." And it takes care of things for you. Now, sitting here as we go down this, what is a, a rough road in a typical car, the the DS does such a good job of remaining level. Um, and that is, it's a very weird sensation, right? Because you go into, you ever experience a car from the 60s or 70s from America, and they're very rolly, right? Very softly sprung, but they kind of roll and wander. This car doesn't do that, yet it is still incredibly soft. Absolutely, and what this car is, it's very pliant to the road surface. It, it will chase and move itself around for the crown of the road and bumps and imperfections and curves, but it, it hugs the road in a kind of different way than you probably could expect in any other car. And it took some getting used to, uh, but it, once you get used to it, this car delivers an incredibly uh, responsive and uh, confident kind of a driving experience. Yeah, uh, we're going to come up to a little road which is going to go to the right here. I think it's going to be after this red Cadillac. Do you see that? It says Thor Avenue. Uh, we'll go ahead and hang it right down there. So what about like a downshift? If we were in third and wanted to go in a second. We'll just go around the corner. It's yep. slow. We'll flick it into second. Wow. And Bob's your uncle. That's pretty amazing. Now, um, what was the hardest part of, you know, learning to drive this vehicle? Discovering how it was engineered to be operated. For example, you start this car up and you have to wait for the hydraulics to uh, power the suspension to the height that you expect to operate it at. Mm. And so you have to wait. So there's a pause right there. Then the brakes, the 
brake button is very sensitive and you don't mash on that like you do on a typical car. And then the shifting, after you realize how easy and superior it is, it, you wonder why more cars weren't engineered this way. Did they ever have a fully automatic transmission available? They did a, a, a option these cars for some markets with a Borg Warner 35 with a letter I don't know, uh, three speed automatic, it was a fully automatic transmission. Yeah. Now if someone was in, interested in purchasing this vehicle, would you recommend they go for the Citromatic or would you recommend a manual? I think I'd get the Citromatic. It, it makes it, it's part of the quirky fun. Any more um, maintenance that's involved with that, that transmission? No, not really. You have to get it set up properly. And I think if you call that maintenance on the front end, once set up properly, it becomes incredibly easy and very intuitive to operate. Uh, we're going to go right here. We'll do one more little loop. And um, talk to me about your favorite part of the driving experience. Uh, the look on people's faces. <laughs> mm. this, this car wasn't common and people don't know what it is, and but they're sure. Or you can see that there are people who've been in Europe who go, oh, my grandmother had one of those in France, or when I was in England, we rode around in one. Now, we're located here outside of Denver. Um, do you find that there's a pretty big community around these cars? It's pretty compact. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to say it was larger, but uh, no, there are only maybe a dozen of these that would be in service, and probably this, maybe a half a dozen that you might actually expect to be following me up the road today. Wow, so it's pretty limited. Yes. So even though they built 38,000, um, there's, there's not many that are still around. That's correct. Let's talk a little bit about the values on these cars because um, there seems to be a huge gap in the market. I see several of these on marketplaces for five to 10K that need restoration. And then there's not much in Canada that 15, 20, but then there's a lot over 40 grand. What is going on with the DS market? You should expect to have a price commensurate with the kind of work that you are gonna have to do or the money you're gonna have to put back into it. To get any of these cars up to a day-to-day -day driver as I have with this one, you should expect to pay at least 40K for this. Yeah. Uh, if you spend less, you're probably gonna have an offset in the not very distant future that's gonna bring you up to 40K pretty easy. So are these expensive cars to store? Y they're not terribly expensive, but it's getting the person or the knowledge oh. to do that. Interesting. Now, because you are so involved in this community and you know this car so well, I'd like to give, uh, or I'd like to hear your takeaway about DS ownership and what people should expect. They should expect to never attempt to be in a hurry, <laughs> rob banks, or not be asking questions. Because if you're shy and you want to rob banks and you don't like asking, answering questions from strangers, this is not the car for you. <laughs> um, everywhere you go, people will give you the thumbs up and they are going to ask you about this car. And to me, that's part of the absolute enjoyment of it. There's so much fun and quirky about this car. I just love it. And it's a fun, easy car to drive. And, you know, I like sharing it with people. So, you know, this isn't a car for the shy or the timid. And is it as unreliable as the internet will have you think? <laughs> the internet is wrong about so many things. And yet that's just one more of those things. I mean, I think we could probably identify pitfalls of ownership of any car that's 50 years old. Yeah. And like any of those cars, if properly maintained and serviced, this car is as incredibly reliable as anything out there. Well, Kevin, I can't thank you enough mm -hmm. for telling your story, telling the story of the DS um, in, in such a great manner. And guys, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you on the next episode.